The continued production and continued spending on nuclear weapons is not a strategic decision. It's not a strategic rationale, but rather is motivated by corporate interests and vested interests. That's the voice of Alicia Sanders Zachary, Policy and Research Coordinator at ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Michelle Doe. Welcome back to Press the Button. Friday, July 16th marked the 76th anniversary of the Trinity nuclear test, the beginning of the nuclear weapons age. 67 nuclear bombs alone were detonated on the Marshall Islands. Tom, this legacy of nuclear testing, often seen as a technical feat, is really one of both environmental and racial injustice. Hey, Michelle, and could not agree more. And also last week saw a new book revealing details about a more recent moment in nuclear history when just after the January 6 riots on the Capitol, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi asked for assurances that an unhinged President Trump would not be able to launch nuclear weapons. Uh, As our listeners know, all presidents since Truman have had this unilateral authority. And in this new book called I Alone Can Fix It, uh, Pelosi told General Milley, that she was deeply concerned about a crazy, dangerous, and maniac Trump, uh, that he might use nuclear weapons during his final days in office. Uh, Unfortunately, as we see from the book, Pelosi accepted General Milley's vague reassurances, um, and nothing changed. Uh, But as our listeners know, this is an issue the Biden administration could fix if it wanted to. So stay tuned. And let's look at what else is happening on the nuclear front. Michelle, what do you have lined up on early warning? This week, we talk about what's happening in Iran. This last week marked the sixth anniversary of the Iran nuclear deal. Despite making it to this milestone, hopes for a quick renewal of the deal are fading. Iran is putting negotiations in Vienna on hold until the inauguration of its new president, Ibrahim Raisi. So we talk about what this delay means and what a new Iranian negotiation team means for the future of the deal. And after that, I sit down with Alicia Sanders Zachary. She is the policy and research coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, better known as ICANN. She recently co authored a report that reveals how much money the nine nuclear states spent on nuclear weapons last year at the same time they were battling COVID 19. Uh, And it's a lot. She also tells us about the government corporate think tank system that is fueling the cycle of nuclear spending and how governments are not spending enough on other security threats, such as the pandemic. Uh, And she sees the spending decisions not as strategic as they're often uh, portrayed, but as motivated by corporate and vested interests. So please stay tuned. And finally, if you want to hear more about what you can do to prevent more nuclear weapons, tune into this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. As usual, if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps to grow our show and our audience, and we appreciate it. But with that, let's get into the episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning, early warning, early warning, early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today, I'm joined by Ryan Costello, Policy Director at the National Iranian American Council. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Negotiations among Iran deal signatories are now on hold. Iran appears to be unwilling to resume the Vienna negotiations until after Ibrahim Raisi is inaugurated as the new Iranian president in early August. So now we're expecting that talks will not resume before mid-August. Why are the Iranians delaying? So I think a lot of people expected uh, going into the Iranian elections that it was still possible for Rouhani to take uh, the political hit of reversing Iran's nuclear advances uh, in exchange for sanctions relief. And then the incoming president, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, 
uh, would end up getting all of the political credit, benefiting from the sanctions relief and so on. But that idea has basically been squelched right now. Uh, you had uh, Iran's foreign minister, Javad Zarif, uh, visit Iran's parliament and essentially lay out all the progress that had been made under the Rouhani administration in restoring the Iran nuclear deal or JCPOA. Uh, and he got into very uh, stark detail on exactly what sanctions could be lifted under a return and then said, it's up to the Raisi administration. That was followed uh, by the president, Hassan Rouhani, uh, announcing this week essentially that his hands had been tied, uh, that the return could have happened in the last three, four, five, six months, but he was pre prevented from doing so. Uh, so now, uh, you know, essentially this, this notion of the lame duck negotiating a reentry to the JCPOA is off the table, and we're all looking to see uh, what Raisi is going to be uh, doing once he comes into office on August 5th. Uh, and, you know, I think one indication, one theory of the case would be that, uh, you know, largely this delay is bureaucratic, that, uh, you know, we got into Iran's uh, political season, there was an election, now there's a transfer of power taking place, and thus, you know, Iran wasn't able to make it happen, but it still, you know, picks up where it left off next month. Uh, but there are some worrying indications that that might not be the case, that instead Raisi is going to choose escalation as a means of extracting additional concessions or perhaps doesn't even want to return to the JCPOA to begin with. And, you know, right now we don't really know. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fact that these talks have dragged out, uh, you know, is definitely concerning. So how has the U.S. responded? Well, you know, I think, you know, going back to when the Biden administration, you know, first came in, uh, I think there was, you know, a few weeks of delay, there was some growing concern uh, that they weren't seizing the moment uh, with the Rouhani administration to get the deal done before the Iranian election. And then things kind of kicked into overdrive. We had a lot of indirect negotiations in Vienna, six rounds of talks. Uh, based on all indications, it looks like uh, the U.S. has put uh, significant sanctions relief on the table that would essentially be the U.S. upholding its end of the bargain, that it would lift nuclear-related sanctions. It would also lift some of these uh, Trump-era sanctions that were designed to block a return to the deal and deny Iran any benefit from the deal. So, you know, it, it seems like they've engaged in good faith, but, you know, run into that political calendar where it, things become very difficult on the Iranian side. And, you know, going back to kind of thinking through how a JCPOA return could happen under a Biden administration, you know, I always viewed it as like the window opening as soon as Biden gets into office. That Rouhani, you know, has some time. He was the guy who originally negotiated the nuclear deal back in 2013 uh, to 2015 with the Obama administration, you have Biden coming back in, Obama's vice president, and pretty much a lot of the people who negotiated the deal in the first place. That was really a, a peak time to get the deal done. And gradually, I think as time has gone on, that window has closed a little bit more. It's still open, it's still possible, but you know the political prospects uh, become much harder. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, if I were the, the Biden administration, I'd want to uh, use this couple of weeks to try to achieve lower term goals like, uh, you know, do, completing a prisoner swap. There's still dual nationals uh, being, uh, you know, held uh, in Iran uh, on trumped up charges. Uh, you know, perhaps that's the, the, the thing that could be accomplished in this, this lame duck. And I think that would be a very positive signal. Uh, heading into a Raisi administration, if that's able to happen. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I do worry that there's, uh, you know, only so long that the Biden administration can hold out uh, when it appears that Iran is less than interested uh, in finalizing the talks. So last week marked the sixth anniversary of the JCPOA and just taking stock all the ups and downs over these last six years, what do you think is the likelihood that we'll see the US and Iran return to compliance with the deal? You know, I definitely think it's still possible. There are basically two ways you can resolve the nuclear standoff with Iran, one of which is through diplomacy and the diplomatic agreement that is hanging out there is the JCPOA. It's on the table. Everybody knows what it is. It, it meets the bottom lines in both nations' capitals, at least it did 
uh, six years ago. So the easiest work ahead is getting back to that agreement. It 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 has kind of set the bar in terms of what an agreement can be accomplished between the U.S. and Iran, which have had a very adversarial relationship for 42 years. So, um, you know, I think it's it's really critical that efforts be made to restore that agreement. If that's not the case, you know, on the diplomatic path, that's uh, you're basically left with a less for less agreement, something that looks like an interim nuclear deal that was struck uh, between 2013 and 2015, joint plan of action, uh, where uh, you know basically Iran rolled back the 20% enriched uh, uranium. It's got a little bit of access to its uh, reserves abroad and you know some enhanced monitoring, but it wasn't really all that much of a long-term solution. It was really more of a uh, you know a, a band-aid on the situation, not a, a long-term thing that's going to get a lot of confidence that Iran's not going to pursue a nuclear weapon. Uh, so, and I, I'm not sure if that's something that the Raisi administration would be interested in either. It, it wouldn't uh, deliver anywhere near as much sanctions relief. And, and I think the question is out there as to what degree of sanctions relief Iran really wants. Is it something that would be, I think, you know, more transformational for the Iranian people and really better their economic lot through the JCPOA, where you do have some level of normalization of economic activities undergoing? Or is the leadership, which is now dominated by hardliners, uh, much more comfortable with a, a limited economic situation where uh, the people are, uh, you know, <laughs> impoverished, uh, inflation is extremely high, but uh, there's a, uh, you know, a, a, a threat to any, um, you know, democratic movement that may, you know, take shape and so forth. We saw back under the Trump administration's maximum pressure, a lot of brutality uh, whenever Iranian protesters went out into the streets. Uh, so it's, 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 it's possible that you know, they don't want uh, economic relief like the, the last administration and perhaps uh, have a different vision for maintaining a hold on power and uh, you know, uh, essentially not delivering much economic relief. Well, seven minutes is far too short. Um, we'll continue to keep an eye on this and hope to talk to you soon. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks so much for having me. The global death toll from COVID-19 recently hit a staggering 4 million. Just for a sense of scale, 4 million is roughly the population of Los Angeles and close to half of New York City. It is a big number. And while the pandemic seems to be under control here in the United States, uh, this is far from true globally, where the crisis is now a race between the vaccine and the highly contagious Delta variant. So you might think that the United States and other countries uh, would reassess their budget priorities and put more money into fighting the pandemic and less into things that play no role in stopping COVID, such as, oh, maybe nuclear weapons. Well, think again. In 2020, as the pandemic took off, the nine states that have nuclear weapons spent a whopping $72 billion on nukes, about $138,000 per minute, and that's an increase over the previous year. So many nations, including the states with nuclear weapons, like India, which are also having a hard time vaccinating their people, uh, are spending ever more on nuclear weapons. And this information on nuclear excess comes from an, a new report called Complicit, 2020 Global Nuclear Weapons Spending. And we are lucky enough today to have one of the authors of this report here today to help us understand what's going on. Uh, Alicia Sanders Zachary is a policy and research coordinator at the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, where she conducts research on the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons and the Humanitarian Impact of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, welcome, Alicia. Thanks so much for having me. Alicia, your report looks at how much nations are spending on nuclear weapons at a time when you might expect them to focus on other priorities. In your view, what is going on here and what findings surprised you the most? So in terms of kind of what was very surprising, I would say, or shocking is, you know, that the, the global spending on nuclear weapons 
remained incredibly high at $72.6 billion in the context of a global pandemic in 2020. We did this estimate in 2019 as well and found you know, a very high spending total, but I think it's really um, difficult to, to comprehend how these nine countries could continue to, to waste this amount of money um, you know, during a global health crisis. I would say another, I think, surprising uh, part of the report for me personally was looking into um, the amount of money that think tanks researching and writing about nuclear weapons receive uh, from the companies that are producing nuclear weapons. This was kind of a new aspect of the report, something I, I hadn't really looked into before. I didn't know how widespread um, you know, this, this issue, I would say, is um, and is part of the global spending cycle um, in, in one year. So one of the things that your report drove home to me is, is how insensitive nuclear spending is to what else is going on in the world right? It, it's, it's this kind of machine that just keeps churning no matter what. And, and you talk about in the report uh, this nuclear weapons spending cycle, the, this, this kind of ongoing process from governments to corporations to lobbyists to think tanks, as, as you just mentioned. Tell us more about that and how it works, because that seems to be driving this entire process. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is, as I mentioned, we did a report in 2019 doing the first estimate looking at uh, how do we kind of calculate the methodology of, of how much each country is spending on nuclear weapons. And this year, as we updated that report, we wanted to look at more of the bigger picture because there definitely is a bigger picture of what's, what's sustaining this cycle. Um, you know, what are all the components of the nuclear weapons production spending cycle? Um, and in doing this, we looked at first, you know, updating how much each country allocated towards nuclear weapons and their budgets, um, but then looking at how much did they give out in contracts in a year uh, to the companies that are producing nuclear weapons, and then how much do those companies spend both on uh, think tanks, which research and write about nuclear weapons, and on lobbyists who are then, you know, lobbying policymakers to spend more on defense in the next year. And that's, that's the cycle and that's kind of the flow of money and of profit um, on the, the production of weapons of mass destruction. Now, give us a sense of scale. How much money are we talking about that is flowing? You know, we get the number that the governments are spending, but how much of that goes into corporations and therefore down to lobbyists and think tanks? I mean, it's, it's always billions and millions. It's just a massive, massive amount of money. Um, you know, companies got over 27 billion in one year, uh, and that varies by a company. But, you know, some companies like um, Lockheed Martin and, uh, and Northrop Grumman received billions. Others received millions in contracts. Uh, and then again, it's millions onwards. So to think tanks in one year, this, this really surprised me, received um, five to ten million dollars uh, from the companies producing nuclear weapons, and lobbyists also received 117 million in 2017. Um, and this, you know, that the, the amount of money is also very interesting in that it's it's really a, you know you could say a nice return on investment for the companies who are spending 100 million 100 you know over 100 billion dollars lobbying, which seems like a lot, but then they're getting you know, over 27 billion back in contracts. So, you know, it's really a system that works in, in their favor uh, to, to continue the production of nuclear weapons. For sure. And, and so let's, let's talk about some of the countries involved here. Um, you know, you're, you're focused in the report on the nuclear states, the nine nuclear states, um, including India. Uh, and I don't mean to focus on them or, or call them out. But uh, we know that India is having a really, really hard time um, with the pandemic. Um, so that's one of the examples where you would think uh, they might be doing more um, to shift their resources and their priorities around. Are there other countries like India that have nuclear weapons that are having a particularly hard time fighting the pandemic? Well, I, I think it is important to note that this, this all research comes from 20, 2020. Um, so this was a period when really most countries, um, some countries we have more information about than others, but 
most countries were facing critical shortages in medical supply equipment and and really you know grappling with the worst global health, health crisis um, you know the, the the world had seen in in quite a while um, so it really was you know a widespread problem a widespread security threat that clearly was not being addressed or being helped uh, by these massive expenditures towards weapons of mass destruction. Um, and I think you know something else about the pandemic that, that's notable in, in connection with nuclear weapons is that we also know that nuclear weapons, any use of nuclear weapons uh, would be a global health crisis as well of unimaginable proportions. And as we were seeing you know, the, the difficulty to respond the overwhelming um, number of patients during COVID, we know that a single nuclear weapon strike would also uh, certainly um, over overfill ICU beds, leave uh, doctors and nurses struggling to care for the number of patients. So, I think there, you know, it's of course unfortunate that the the expenditure was wasted on nuclear weapons, but also by funding nuclear weapons we could be increasing the risk for a different and still drastic uh, type of global health catastrophe. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the corporations themselves, because this is a big focus um, of your report. These corporations, and again, we're not talking just the United States, we're talking globally here, uh, are making a lot of money off of nuclear weapons as a, a business. I mean, this is, this is big business, this is billions of dollars. That means lots of money, that means lots of jobs, that means lots of congressional or uh, government support, whatever country you're in, which, which drives this process. And, and some would say that, that the corporate uh, profit-making process drives the nuclear weapons industry globally, you know, maybe even more than, than ideology or threat perceptions. But I'm, but I'm wondering if you can give me your sense of, of how important the corporate aspect is to this um, and, and maybe just a few examples um, of what you found in your report. I think it's really central. Um, and we see that in, again, the, the billions that get paid out each year to, to these companies, really not not that many, uh, you know, a dozen, dozen or so companies in the world that are producing these weapons of mass destruction and, and how those companies reinvest the money they're getting to make sure that they keep getting more money in the future. And, you know, looking at how this spending continued during a pandemic, increased during a pandemic, I think it's, it's clear that the continued production and continued spending on nuclear weapons is not a strategic decision. It's not a strategic rationale, but rather is motivated by corporate interest and vested interests. And we see that, you know, that flow of money that, that keeps it going, um, which I will say can sound very disheartening, but at the same time, I, I hope that the report also helps to show all of the different pressure points um, that people can put on to to interrupt this cycle as well, uh, and to show that you know this is just money talking, and you know nuclear weapons uh, are not a, a, a guarantee of security um, at all. Well, you've uh, you segued nicely into my last question, which is, you know, what is ICANN doing? And what can citizens do other than producing great reports like you're doing uh, in their own countries to shift resources from nuclear weapons to other higher priority things like fighting COVID? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I say I think thinking about it as this cycle of billions of dollars can seem very intimidating, but it's really important not to forget that we have public opinion on our side and we do these polls that show in, in countries around the world uh, there's popular support for uh, eliminating nuclear weapons. And, you know, all that's really needed is more organization and public pressure um, to get politicians to do their job and listen to their publics who are demanding uh, the end of nuclear weapons uh, to put pressure on these companies. So it's no longer tenable uh, from a PR perspective to be tied to to weapons of mass destruction uh, and, and persuading every entity in this cycle um, that nuclear weapons are, 
are bad business uh, and and are not something you want to be connected to. Um, and so through, you know, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons helps to move that that norm forward, that stigma. These weapons are now prohibited under international law. And that's something that companies have actually listened to in the past with previous weapons that have been banned. Um, and so, you know, it's up to it's up to us to to ensure that our, our public officials are speaking out against nuclear weapons. They can join ICANN's parliamentary pledge to work to get their country to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we have a cities appeal where people can get their cities uh, to stand up and, and work to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and, you know, you can protest if you have a company branch near you. There's, there's really, a, you know, a lot of ways to, to put pressure on these entities and to, to get them to get out of this cycle uh, and get out of the business of weapons of mass destruction. Thank you very much. I recommend the report highly to all of our listeners. It's called Complicit 2020 Global Nuclear Weapons Spending. Uh, thank you so much for being here and best of work to you and ICANN in all of your work. Thanks so much. And now for everyone's favorite nuclear question and answer segment. Are you ready, Tom? Bring it on, Michelle. This week's question comes from Maddie in Philadelphia. Maddie asks, what organization should I boycott if I don't want my money going to the creation of nuclear weapons and nuclear war? Thanks, Michelle. And Maddie, great question. You know, first off, uh, it's important to realize that the biggest defense contractors, so for example, uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon, are difficult to boycott because they don't sell civilian products, right? You can't buy a Lockheed Martin toaster uh, or a Northrop Grumman automobile. Uh, they, they just don't sell civilian products. And I compare that to the energy sector, where if you don't like what Exxon is doing, you don't fill up your car at Exxon or BP or, you know, Shell Oil. So, so energy companies have a huge um, exposure to corporate influence in a way that uh, uh, defense contractors in the nuclear space just don't. So it just makes it uh, much harder, but not impossible to affect um, the decisions of defense contractors. So instead of boycotting their products, you can, uh, you can not invest your money in them. Right. So this is the approach other people have taken. Invest your money in funds that exclude top nuclear weapons companies. And you can find more about uh, funds that are socially responsible uh, investments at uh, Nuclear Ban US um, and uh, Don't Bank on the Bomb. Uh, there's some more resources there that you can find. Finally, the last thing I would say on this is that the, the buyer for nuclear weapons is the government. Uh, so we need to work with Congress and the Biden administration to support legislation to cancel new nuclear weapons that we don't need, uh, such as the new land-based ballistic missile and the new sea-launched cruise missile. Uh, so get involved, get involved with the local organization, stay involved with plowshares and other groups, uh, because ultimately uh, the government uh, is the buyer for these weapons. And so we need to we need to put pressure on the government. Another week, another question. Thanks, Tom. And thanks, Maddie, for the question. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Alex Hall in Washington, D.C., Delphine Vigil in San Francisco, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Ari Tarpey. Sound design and audio engineering by Michael Padilla at the Soundport Recording Studio in Grass Valley, California. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.